Okay, so we are live. I am just waiting for Dr. Thomas to join in. We are really excited to launch Your Genetic Type. We are going to be talking about specific um, health conditions as they relate to methylation and genetic testing and MTHFR. We have finished recently a amazing breakthrough course called um, MTHFR um, Crash Course. And now we are launching your genetic type and we are going to be doing Facebook lives um, every week. And today we wanted to talk to you about um, vitamin B toxicity and how it relates to nerve damage, how it relates to MTHFR and how it relates specifically to you. So, so we're really excited to, to launch this and, and really help you. And, and we're also excited to launch your genetic type. We're gonna be talking a lot about that. Um, and as we get started here, I see Dr. Thomas, how you doing my friend? Can you hear me, John? Oh, um, it's just hopefully your audio is working or my audio is working. Can you hear me? Looks like your microphone's not plugged in for some reason. So um, I, I don't see a, a microphone availability. When you join in, it should be like a little. Got it. Okay. There you go. All right. All right. First time. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot going on. All right. So I was just doing an introduction. Um, we're excited to be talking. We're going to be doing Facebook lives once a week and uh, getting starting to build this your genetic type Facebook page and, and hopefully soon to be a very uh, raving uh, audience in terms of the information we're giving John. So today we wanted to talk about um, the MTHFR. Again, most people know about that. We just finished as we talked about a um, crash course on MTHFR and we're launching your genetic type, but we want to start to make specific uh, topics about things that people are dealing with as it relates to MTHFR and vitamin B toxicity, nerve damage um, is something that really is relevant for people. So let's, let's dive into that and come up with sort of a, a, an explanation of why, when, where, what, how, all those things and explain your experience and, and most importantly, strategies to recover from this. Yeah, so, you know, neuropathy aspects are, I know, something that both you and I have seen in our practice for, you know, quite a while. And, you know, people sometimes come in with the usual suspects when you're talking about neuropathy components that, you, you know, they're diabetic or they've taken a statin drug, um, you know, post-chemo components. But the, the problem lies where if somebody has neuropathy symptoms, they go to their neurologist and there's not the usual suspect as a trigger, they basically can't, you know, they basically get a garbage can diagnosis of, you know, some type of idiopathic polyneuropathy or chronic inflammatory polyneuropathy, basically saying, hey, you've got this, but we have no clue why. And um, that's where it's time to start thinking outside the box. And, and a lot of times what happens is, through lab work components or, um, you know, through further investigative components, um, people start realizing or starting to connect the dots a little bit that there is a connection with certain D vitamin components um, that are in excess or, or toxic to the body that um, can be factors that drive the neuropathy symptoms. And that's what we'll talk about today is kind of the mechanisms with that, how genetic factors play into that. Um, because a lot of times, um, you know, if it's not the usual suspects driving neuropathy, these factors from a B vitamin utilization standpoint and genetic factors such as MTHFR, uh, NOS, um, SOD components, things of that nature, we'll talk about a little bit about today, are big factors that um, sometimes are underlying issues of why somebody's developing those neuropathy symptoms. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I agree with you. So they go to their neurologist, they have these weird sensations in their feet or their hands, they're not really feeling it. It's either numb, it's tingly, it's painful. They have a, a foot drop or they just don't, they feel like they're walking on, on ants or tacks. And, and so that starts the process, John. So let's just fast forward and fast forward to, okay, I know that there's a genetic component. I, I know 
that there's um, this thing that you can do. You can do a genetic test, and um, hopefully uh, they've done a complete panel, right? They've done not just the MTHFR, but let's kind of start from there. So how, how, when they're not getting the answers and they're taking like medications and Neurontin and Gabapentin or they're taking other things or even like a, a B vitamin and they're getting injections, let's kind of take it from, from the 30,000 view feet and bring it in into, you know, the mirror in front of their face. Yeah, so, you know, when you're talking about the genetic connection and, and the B vitamin excess, that can be a driving factor. And so you see this a lot where, you know, somebody goes to their, their neurologist, their primary, they have symptoms of neuropathy, they run blood work, their B12 levels are high, uh, their B6 levels are high. B12 and B6 are usually when you're talking about neuropathy or, or the usual suspects that can play into that. We know that B6 toxicity, and, and really when we say B6 toxicity, what it really means is too much of the inactive form of B6. And, and really to kind of keep this as simplistic as possible, because we can get really technical on biochemistry and neurology aspects with this, but realistic, when we're talking about the toxicity aspect with B vitamins, it comes down to how much is outside the cell versus how much can get inside the cell. And, and that's sometimes where genetic factors can play in as well, because a lot of times when you're running blood work to look at serum B6 levels, or you're looking at serum B12 levels, a lot of times that's measuring how much B12 is in the body, how much B12 is outside the cells hanging around. And if you see those levels higher, well, all that's telling you is that, hey, you got a whole bunch of B6, or you got a whole bunch of B12, that is there, but it's not being utilized properly. It's inactive. It's not being able to be activated for what we call fuel for delivery, to be able to fuel your cells and, and, and promote activity and promote healing, okay? And, and what happens is when you have those B vitamins that are in excess on the outside and they, they, they can't get through the doorway to get inside, eventually those B vitamins are going to oxidize, okay? And basically when we say oxidize, basically it's going to be those B vitamins are actually going to drive inflammation. Okay, those B vitamins are actually going to do more harm than good. And where a lot of the genetic factors start coming in play now is you have this B vitamin in place and, and it can't get in the cell. There are genetic factors with, with that. There's, there's transport genes as well that are pretty kind of advanced genetic players that deal with what we call, uh, you know, solar transport carrier genes that carry certain vitamins and minerals from outside to inside. Some people have genetic factors that they're just genetically weak in some of those transporters. They can't just get the, the, the certain B vitamins from outside to inside. And now what happens is all that B vitamin is sticking outside and eventually it oxidizes, it creates inflammation. And then the body has to go to work reducing that inflammation. Okay, and, and there are certain pathways that are responsible for helping clearing out those free radicals or those oxidized B vitamins, and it's based on our peroxidation pathway. And where the neuropathy connection really comes in is uh, our nerves need nitric oxide. Okay, they, it's kind of like this um, this needed kind of evil. Nitric oxide is needed for vasodilation of our blood vessels. Nitric oxide is actually needed for our, our nerves to talk to one another. Okay, to be able to say, hey, I'm doing this today, you do this today, let's kind of regrow, let's fire here, let's fire there. You need nitric oxide to, to enhance that communication aspect. Now, what happens is if you've got all this oxidation, these B vitamins, eventually what's going to happen is nitric oxide levels are going to start ramping up a little bit because there's nerve damage going on because of this oxidation, because the B vitamins can't feed the cells. And then eventually all those oxidized or damaged B vitamins are going to bind to um, nitric oxide and create even more massive inflammation, such as proxynitrite. And then the problem there is when people have this chronic inflammatory, you know, polyneuropathy diagnosis, is they have just massive inflammation. And and where a lot of the genetic weakness comes is yes, it's sometimes MTHFR and, and methionine synthase, methionine synthase reductase that deals with B12. Uh, recycling and, and, and uh, you know, capability. But a lot of the problem genetically comes into weakness in nitric oxide, but then weakness in peroxidation in terms of weakness in SOD, weakness in catalase, weakness in glutathione peroxidase to be able to help control that inflammation. And so I always, I always use this example with patients like a, a bucket of water, okay? And if you're taking B vitamins or you can't utilize those B vitamins and, and you're putting inflammation in that bucket, okay? faster than you're taking it out. Eventually the water level is going to rise and it's going to spill over the edge and basically you got a mess. And now all your body's doing is trying to clean up the mess. If you don't do things to start taking water out faster than you're putting it in or, or take those B vitamins out faster than you're putting it in, you're never going to recover. And, and so 
the genetic connection with this, it, there's multiple players. You know, it, it could be the inability to transport the B vitamins. It could be, hey, once the B vitamins are on the outside and they get damaged, the inability to actually clear out the inflammation process that happens from those B vitamins oxidizing fast enough so that bucket of water is filling over the edge. Okay, and so when we look at some of these labs and they're told that they have a B vitamin toxicity aspect, you know, their, their B6 toxicity is a factor or, or their excess B6 is a factor of neuropathy or their B12 levels are too high. The first thing they should, they should think of is like, number one, okay, are you taking too much of a poor quality vitamin? Okay, number one. And the second part is, and most likely what I see, is that, that there's problems taking that B vitamin from outside to inside, and you're actually just driving more inflammation, which is it's just actually fueling the fire for the neuropathy in itself. Where we left off, John, was um, you were, what I got from you was you have too much B6 the first thing to think about is, and then you kind of, then you kind of left, left me from there. So we can kind of pick up from there, and then we'll edit this video for for, for okay. from there. Yeah. So, um, so if, if you have lab work and, and your B six levels are high, or you have lab work and your B twelve levels are high, um, first thing you should think of is that this is a problem, possibly of, like I said, uh, a couple of things. Number one, it could be that you're taking garbage vitamins and you can't process those garbage vitamins effectively. You're taking a lot of inactive forms of those vitamins. Um, or, and the second component is is genetic factors that deal with transport from outside to inside the cell. Okay, and if and if you, if it's a transport component where you just can't get the vitamins from outside to inside then that's going to drive inflammation. It's going to put more stress on peroxidation. And eventually what's going to happen is you're going to start bringing that nitric oxide component in and drive, even fueling more inflammation. And genetically, uh, most of the people that I see with neuropathy aspects typically fall into this genetic component of being like a toxic accumulator. And, and that really is a lot of weakness in glutathione production and recycling is a lot of weakness in peroxid peroxidation and inflammation control. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the first thought process when we're talking about genetic factors and, and B vitamins. And, and if we go further upstream with that, yes, things like MTHFR plays into this, you know, um, because the thing is, is you, if you have problems with, from a MTHFR side of things, or if you have uh, issues with B12 genes, um, and, and it's almost like you just can't produce enough um, biochemical, you know, or, or produce enough active vitamins to be able to kind of methylate and heal and fuel the system, make DNA, make RNA, the whole story goes on and on in terms of those vitamins do, you know, it could be something too where you just can't put enough gas in the tank to be able to heal your, heal your body based on the demand, based on our environment, okay? And that kind of leads us to the next thought process with this um, on these kind of idiopathic or these chronic inflammatory neuropathy presentations is let's say that your B vitamin status is normal, you know, and let's say it's not a oxidized B vitamin component that's driving this. Um, the next usual suspect goes down to the epigenetic components. And, and more often than not, um, people with chronic inflammatory neuropathy presentations or idiopathic neuropathy, um, I would probably say 70% of the time, it's gonna go back to heavy metal or chemical accumulation in the body. And then that brings in genetic factors where, hey, somebody's a poor detoxifier, They've got a mouthful of metal fillings. Um, they've had lead exposure and their body just cannot rid the body of those heavy metals. And guess what? They're accumulating those metals and eventually it's going to start that whole process with inflammation and causing nerve damage going forward. So um, the, it kind of brings back like the foundations of you know pretty much any chronic health issue that people don't have answers to. It really comes down to the kind of the marriage between one's genetic predisposition Okay, and so we're talking about neuropathy, we're talking about the vitamin transport, we're talking about inflammation clearance and genetic factors or somebody's weak there. And then it comes down to the second piece of that, which is the epigenetic, the environment. And, and if, if we're exposed to things um, and we can't get rid of them, they're eventually gonna catch up with us and cause damage. And, and heavy metals, uh, viruses, uh, chemicals, they affect the nervous system pretty darn hard. Um, and I know we spoke, Joel, um, when we talked about doing this topic and, uh, I, I've seen um, many patients with, uh, you know, idiopathic neuropathy components with the B6 aspect, and pretty much every one of them on top of the B6 excess in the blood, and so there's a, a B6 transport issues, pretty much every one of them also had an epigenetic component, which was a heavy metal tag along. And running metal components, it was either something like lead, antimony, cadmium, uh, you know, um, aluminum, um, and even mercury, but lead 
um, being the big one that I've seen over and over and over with XSB6 and those neuropathies. Yeah, listen, there's a mouthful there, John, um, that I'm going to summarize exactly what you said to the best you can. Um, so not to belittle everything you talked about, but just sort of put it in more of a simpler, my mind's a little simpler. Um, in terms of um, number one, um, the first thing is when you do a test, which I think I see all the time and you see all the time, just because the values are high doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're, you have a high value of that nutrient. I think that's a huge distinction in terms of what's inside the cell, what's outside the cell, um, number one. Uh, and unfortunately, doctors aren't really trained at that. When they look at you know, a serum test, they, they, they don't really consider that it could be a low value even though it's a high value on the outside. So that's number mm -hmm. one. Um, number two also, like when we're, what we're putting together is this, the genetic type, which is the name of this, of this Facebook page and our YouTube page and, and basically the business, is that there are certain genetic susceptibilities based on your specific types. And you talked about the toxic accumulator where potentially they're not good at detoxing because of the way their genetics are set up. And then on top of that, if you put in an epigenetic factor, which is typically that perfect storm of a heavy metal, a virus, Lyme disease, that's going to cause the, the bridge from, from one side to the other side to be out. Um, so you're going to have a lot of overflowing bucket like you talked about in terms of once that you know nitric oxide level accumulates uh, eventually it's spilling over and it becomes uncoupled and then that can create a whole problem with someone who may be an under stimulator an over stimulator or a weak immune system which is all the types that we're going to be talking and sharing with people but so so as far as maybe talking about Let's say that describes someone who's listening to this. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. This is exactly me. Like, yeah, I, no neural. Like, that's the other thing that I came away with is they're not going to get this information with the traditional doctors. They're just not. They're, the doctors aren't looking at the genetic component. They're not looking at the epigenetic component. They're not running the right tests. They're not really thinking about fixing this from a, getting to the root cause of the problem. It's just what's the best medication I can put you on and, you know, just hope that you get out of my office as fast as you can. I hate to sort of put such a gloom, gloomy picture on it. But as far as what would that person do given like, oh my gosh, this is me, how would you best recommend what their next steps would be if, th if this is what you're describing? Right. So, in, you know, when you're talking about uh, uh, chronic inflammatory neuropathy or an idiopathic neuropathy aspect, you know, uh, the next step is obviously to investigate things a little further. Because the thing is, if let's let's kind of start with the B vitamin aspect. Let's say that you go in there and your B12 levels are high or B6 levels are high and the doctor's like, you got to stop taking B vitamins. And, and that's kind of like the solution to that. You know, it's like, well, that doesn't really do anything. And that may be even the wrong suggestion, because like you mentioned, um, you know, B, and that's something that drives me nuts is, you know, somebody going their physical and their B12 levels are high and their doctor's like, stop taking B12. But you look at a micronutrient test, which looks at B vitamin status inside the cell, or you look at a methylmalonic acid, which looks at mitochondrial based B12, and that person's deficient. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's not so much that there's too much B12, it's just the B12 can't get in the cell. So it is going to accumulate on the outside, but that person still is deficient inside the cell on that B vitamin. And if they don't address that, they're never going to heal. Okay. And there's genetic factors that play into that. And so kind of investigating things a little bit deeper. The next step is if you, if you've got an, if you've got a B vitamin toxicity or you're told that your, your neuropathy is driven by B vitamin toxicity aspects, the next thing is two things. Number one is you want to look at micronutrient testing to figure out what's the status of that, that vitamin inside the cell to, define, to really determine if you're toxic, because, you know, Yes, having too much outside is going to drive inflammation, but the thing is, is, if there's not enough inside the cell, that could be a factor as well. And then the next piece of that, obviously, you want to look at genetic factors. You know, you want to, you know, investigate this or work with a practitioner that understands genetics at a level that's going to look at these factors and deal with transport and recycling these B vitamins because if you, that's something that you don't address, you know, your neurological system is just going to continue to be compromised and inflammation is just going to continue to you know, spin out of control. Um, and, and the first thing a lot of times with that is controlling inflammation. So it's looking at peroxidation aspects and things of that nature. 
and how your body can clear and control inflammation as those B vitamins are kind of accumulating outside the cell and driving inflammation in the first place. Because if there's genetic components, um, you know, you're going to have a tendency for those B vitamins to want to accumulate over and over and over again, you know, so something you got to work lifelong going for, and it can be done. Then the next step is obviously investigate things outside the box from an epigenetic standpoint. You're going to go through the usual suspect. You know, if you're not diabetic and you, you're not post-chemo and you haven't taken a statin drug, you know, you're going to want to look at heavy metals, you know, first and foremost. You know, to me, that, that's always a starting point. Um, and, and obviously, if there's other symptoms with um, the neuropathy that indicate that, okay, this person also has Hashimoto's, maybe then you got to look at viral components, you know. Um, you know, if they've got also like chronic fatigue and other neurological components, maybe you want to investigate viruses, you know, as well. Maybe you want to investigate Lyme component. But you're always going to want to address metals because, you know, I, I, very, very rarely do I see a patient that's got neuropathy, whether it be even driven by something like diabetes or something along those lines. But the idiopathic or the inflammatory based neuropathies, very, very rarely do I see somebody where we check metals and metals is not a piece of it. And then you get into like specifically where these metals specifically disrupt things. And here's the thing, a lot of these metals disrupt peroxidation pathway. Basically these metals also disrupt how your body can control inflammation. So you kind of get in this vicious cycle that you're driving inflammation because of the metal, but then the metals is preventing you from controlling the inflammation. And then that basically just continues to fuel itself. And then things get out of control and you're left with symptoms that you just really can't get your hands around. Yeah, and you know what happens too is they call it the paradoxal Herxheiming reaction when they go in there and they try to do a viral uh, protocol or they do a heavy metal protocol and they just don't do well with it because right. they put the cart before the horse. I always say they went for a marathon and they haven't even bought running shoes, right? They haven't even got their 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 warm ups on and they're and they're going ahead and doing a full blown marathon, which they shouldn't do. So as far as you know, um, I know when we've talked recently that in in just your private practice you just won't walk, work with anyone that doesn't have a genetic component because that's just looking at the ocean with blinders on. You need to see a full picture. But let's talk about the, you know, with 23andMe and Ancestry.com, you'll still look at those reports because there are value to them. But when we're deep, deep you know, diving deep down into solo transport uh, enzymes, and um, peroxidation enzymes and nitric oxide enzymes and pero you know all those things that you're seeing. Um, how many times do you see those coming up incomplete when you run them through your your system that you're looking at those genes that you know you you I guess how how often do you see that happening where they're just those 23andMe and the ancestries aren't complete enough that you're not getting a full picture. Yeah, and the thing is, is that there's limitations in those, what they make available um, to us to download uh, what's on their gene cards to give us kind of the full picture. Um, you know, but the thing is, 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 you know, sometimes like if somebody already has that information, it can give us, you know, pieces of the puzzle, you know, so if somebody has version 4, 23 me that they did, you know, in 2015, you know, it may give us an, uh, enough information for the factors that we're looking at. You know, it's not going to give you a lot of the solo transport carriers that show you B vitamin transport. But the thing is, is, you know, if you have a micronutrient test, you know, or if you have, you know, like methylonic acid and somebody's B12 and their blood is high, but a micronutrient test or methylonic acid is low, you know, like I don't need a genetic test to tell me that, okay, there's a problem with transport, you know. Um, so that's where kind of just the, the, the experience kind of comes in from that side of it. Um, but the thing is, is, you know, you know, like you mentioned, like I, I, what I do is I, I specialize in genetics. And so for people to work with me, I need genetics because that's what I do. And like I always mention and said this many times, I'm not the first doctor to the party. You know, a lot of people have worked with, you know, traditional doctors and work with a lot of alternative doctors and work with some really good, you know, functional medicine doctors that have done a lot of leg work, but the genetic components was a big missing piece to this, which allows us to maybe investigate things a little different as well as have some information, maybe how to support things a little different. So maybe some of the things are doing properly, um, like doing a uh, oral chelation protocol for metals. You know, maybe there is a missing component of why they're having bad responses and, and that missing component are genetic aspects. So, you know, 23 mean ancestry, you know, gives us, it gives us starting points if somebody already has that done, but there are more advanced genetic tests that are out there that we run on our patients that kind of gives us, you know, a little bit more of the complete 
picture of somebody that has a chronic issue, specifically somebody that may have a idiopathic or a chronic inflammatory neuropathy presentation, it's going to give us more of those genes that deal with inflammation, more of those genes that deal with B6 and B12 um, utilization and absorption and things of that nature, so we can get a clearer picture of what's fueling this in the first place. Because <clears throat> if it's not the usual suspects from a genetic standpoint, and you're labeled with a idiopathic or chronic inflammatory neuropathy um, you know, diagnosis, um, usually it comes down to genetics and what are those epigenetic stressors that have not been checked or identified yet that are creating that perfect storm. And once you identify those two pieces, now you can get to work on recovery. Yeah, and those people, like you said, they'll never get better. I know like personal cases that just haven't had the the proper workup and they're not moving the needle whatsoever. And, and I got to say, John, what I'm really excited about with, you know, our project of your genetic type and doing these Facebook lives is to dispense the information. But we also understand that not everyone can work with you or I one on one, um, but they are very um, astute and they're very um, disciplined and they are running up against a lot of obstacles with doctors that are are very stubborn and dogmatic. Um, so they put the work into their own hands. And that's our goal is really to provide tools for people to a get the test, right, so that they right. can confirm that I have the test, um, and then b get the follow along information. So they may not necessarily be working with URI directly, but they can also have a cheat sheet, if you will, or a user guide to be able to, you know, a understand their genetic type. I mean, we'll talk more about that, you know, as we go forward on the Facebook lives, but realize, hey, you probably have a genetic type number one that makes the perfect storm that much more perfect for express expression. And we want you to understand that first. We don't want you to have to go and, and you know, relearn methylation. We just want to sort of give you the cheat sheets and understand what's your genetic type first. And then from there, um, what are the proper tests based on that genetic type um, so that you can get the most value from it um, and, and understand how to interpret them. And then most importantly, understand how to um, implement the information that you have. So maybe talk just a little bit about that as a teaser to give the you know, people that are listening um, what that entails. Yeah, so, you know, when we talk about, like, you know, the previous MTH of our crash course that we did, um, you know, and even, you know, patients um, or people I spoke with that are trying to learn genetics, a lot of it's, you know, uh, you know, sometimes can get too advanced. And so what we've really kind of done is try and streamline this a little bit where based on, you know, history and based on genetic um, factors, uh, you know, people can really real quickly determine what their genetic type is. And, and then based on that, put their focus on that genetic type and, and then based on that, based on symptoms, based on the genetic type, then be able to kind of determine what are the rabbit holes that they have to go down to investigate? You know, what are the usual suspects that we see in our office that we would recommend to a patient sitting in front of us that has a neuropathy presentation and this is their genetic predisposition going into it? What are the things that we would look at? You know, and so we're kind of putting together um, like you said, kind of a user's guide, um, you know, kind of an algorithm so people can say, all right, they can go from point A to point B to point C and do some of this stuff on their own and be able to take that stuff back to their doctor, um, you know, when needed to be able to really kind of take their health back into their own hands um, to get resolution, you know, because it's all about improving quality of life. And, and you know, I've seen many, many people with neuropathies and um, it's, no, it's not fun, you know, and it really does affect quality of life. It affects sleep. It affects ability to, you know, be active, um, you know, from a pain standpoint, it's just miserable. And so if somebody can understand that, okay, there are these genetic factors and, and then based on things that we're putting together that people are going to be able to learn about and be able to kind of classify that they're a specific genetic type, put their focus genetically there and then be able to investigate these usual suspect stressors. And then these are the things you can do to address that. And with that, people can start getting um, control and getting quality of life back. And that's what this is all about. Yeah, and you know, and really get some significant improvements because they're not dumb. I mean, they're doing a lot of great work already. The majority of the people that are already on their radar, um, but it's that extra two degrees that they need to turn the temperature up to sort of bring it to a boil and really see those improvements. And I always say it's sort of, 
good news, bad news. I mean, the bad news is when you have a neuropathy or you have a methylation issue or you have a, a perfect storm of the environmental factors that you have that just super overlap with the genetic susceptibilities, a lot of things are off, right? Not just peripheral neuropathies, but central neuropathies like brain fog, focus, concentration, which that can be even more debilitating than someone that doesn't feel their hands or their toes. Um, and, then, and then from there, um, really understand what the genetic component is and what the proper test to confirm it is. And then really it's a matter of implementing it and having the buckets drain and seeing that extra temperature turn up so that now they're seeing amazing improvements and all the things that weren't working from the perfect storm are now working and you you have the tools to have it be like a verb and now it's not just a one-time thing and and now you get to understand like what are like you said to me john like i think you said as well like everyone's gonna like explain it. everyone's gonna have like you know even even you and i are gonna have you know stress moments uh or a reactivation of a of a cold or a flu but now they're equipped with how to do what to do with it so kind of sum that up in a nutshell yeah. like what, what does that mean yeah so the thing is like when you're talking about genetics and, and you know we talk about the expression of these genes and how our environment can express these things because a lot of times you have these genes your whole life obviously and they've never been a player and so a lot of times once they're expressed it's like a dimmer switch you may not be able to turn it off but you can dim it down but if there's things you do um, it's maybe going to turn that dimmer switch back up and, and so symptoms may ramp up and so what I always tell patients um, and people I talk with that have chronic issues is, you know, once you kind of determine that, that, that kind of marriage between your genetics and your epigenetics, right, and you figure out how to kind of really manage those two stories where you're trending in the right direction, you're, you're healing, you're, you're recovering, you know, it, it's about quality of life. And, and I always tell patients this, it's, it's, if you can have, you know, 26 or 27 good days out of a month, but there's a couple days that are just not so good, um, that's a, that's a win, you know, and then more importantly, what are the things you can do that when you do have a bad day, you have strategies to pull yourself out so that the bad day doesn't turn into a bad week and doesn't turn into a bad month. You're able to recover and bounce back. And like I told you, you know, when we talked, I think it was earlier, um, this week that, you know, Hey, um, you know, everything we do, we still have bad days. You know, there's days that I don't feel great, you know, it's like, but it's things you can do to recover, to pull yourself out within a couple of hours or by the next day um, so that, hey, you're right back where you need to be. And we're human. And in the world we live in, um, you know, we're exposed to chemicals, we're exposed to toxins, we're exposed to, you know, bacteria and parasites on our food that our body or immune system is going to try and fight off. And so, you know, there's going to be days that just aren't that good. But if we, if our body's able to bounce back real quick how it's supposed to, that's what this is all about. And that's what we really strive for. And so, you know, realize that if you've got neuropathy symptoms, um, you know, with, with what this talk is about, but it really kind of plays into any, you know, chronic health issue, that if things are turned in the right direction, uh, and hey, you get to the point where quality of life's better and things are real stable, but you have a couple days here or there where you notice symptoms ramp up again, it's just, it's part of the process. It's part of being human. Okay. But, you know, it's more, like I said, it's about that change. It's about quality of life. And it's about that information, um, be able to take that into your hands to kind of understand that. And that's so empowering. Yeah. And especially like, as we've categorized it, John, as you start to learn, finally, your genetic type, like it makes so much more sense. Like, oh, my genetic type is I've always had, you know, a weak immune system or I get overstimulated. So, you know, that's coming really soon, guys. So um, we're saying within the next week or so, not even, um, we're going to be less than two yeah. weeks from yesterday. So that's the goal. Right, exactly. Less than two weeks from yesterday, just really rolling out our foundational genetic type program so that you can start to wet your palate and start to understand what you can do about this. So that's super exciting. Um, also, you know, make sure that you, you let, you, you know, you follow us on YouTube. We're going to have your genetic type um, videos. We're going to have also podcasting. Um, we're going to also be doing, you know, on our your, your genetic type website where you're going to be able to get access to all of this stuff. So also make sure that you post, you know, any comments in the thread. The only problem about Zoom is you don't see live thread comments. So John and we'll go back in there and answer them. And if you have any questions that you want for us to cover on a topic, 
um, for a Facebook Live or a podcast. Um, those are that how that's how we got this conversation today. And usually, when one person asks a question, a thousand people have the same question. So we really value your input to give us some, you know, what you guys want to hear. Um, John, anything else you want to add? No, I think we kind of uh, you know covered what we intended to cover with this, um, and hopefully, you know, it probably you know you know created some more questions and some answers, but at least, you know, there's some answers to think outside the box and, and start, you know, trying to get control of this. And more importantly, realize that there are answers out there. You know, there are answers that are stressors from an epigenetic standpoint. There are answers from a genetic standpoint that drive this in the first place. And now you just got to get to work and figure out those pieces of the puzzle. And with that, more often than not, you're going to be able to get control of this. Yeah, and notice, I mean, you know, a lot, you and I um, owe a lot of um, uh, recognition for, you know, the, the trailblazers and Dr. Lynch um, for getting, you know, MTHFR on the map, but notice we really never even talked about MTHFR to, to, to a large extent, and that's what we want to do is we want to have a paradigm shift where MTHFR is super important, um, and it did start to open that door, but now how do we use it in terms of what's going on with me and what I'm dealing with, and John and I have had private practices for a long time now where we've gone through the, you know, trial and errors of how do we organize this so that we use the information information so you the end user don't have to be the scientist or the doctor and you can just implement your genetic type so that you get the best results going forward so super excited john i'm glad we did this today um we'll do another one every tuesday at 3 p.m eastern standard time and um, and then look for the next two weeks to start to understand about your genetic type and that's that's what we got for today